Yes, and the bedpost was his own. The bed was his own. The room was his own. Best and happiest of all, the time before him was his own. To make amends in. I will live in the past, the present, and the future, Scrooge repeated as he scrambled out of bed. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. O oh, Jacob Marley, heaven and the Christmas time be praised for this. I say it on my knees, old Jacob, on my knees. Stave 5 of A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens is a short one. It's the victory lap. But there's still things to talk about. This video will include four sections. A So What Happened section where we recap Stave 5, a Literary Criticism section, a Writer's Corner section, and an Adrian's Corner section. So, what happened? Scrooge realizes he's in his own bed. But he doesn't know what day it is, so he sticks his head out the window and asks a boy who says... It's Christmas. Scrooge then gives the boy money to go buy a turkey. The boy returns with the turkey and the butcher, and then pays for the bird to be delivered to Cratchit's house anonymously. Then Scrooge goes to his nephew's house, where absolutely everyone is surprised to see him. But Scrooge isn't there to be seen. He's there to party. And they party. The next day, Bob is late to work. And Scrooge doesn't let on that he's had a change of heart. So he bullies Cratchit all the way in to promising him a raise. So thematically, there are a couple different things to talk about with this stave. Number one, so we're not getting into the whole story type of deal. We will be getting into that on the recap video or the review video pardon me but today what we're doing with stave five is we have in the literary criticism section two real themes to talk about two real big societal questions number one upon receiving word that it is christmas what scrooge does is he sends off for the great big turkey the prize winning turkey and he has it sent anonymously to Bob Cratchit's house. Now, this may not seem like the appropriate place to bring up this conversation, but it is. If you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. If you teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. Why would that maybe necessarily be worth talking about here, despite the fact that what Scrooge does at the conclusion of this book is give Bob Cratchit that raise that he wants? Well, what we have in Scrooge as he decides to turn the page is a very big question about Scrooge's fortunes. We have him throwing away money like a drunken sailor, don't we? We have him just spending money, giving it away, throwing it all out there. We know that Scrooge has a lot of money. But if you've dealt with money, you know money's not about availability. Money is about sustainability. You see this all the time in people who win the lottery and end up going bankrupt, despite the fact that they have more money at one time than they probably would have earned during the entirety of their life. So, when we have Scrooge throwing around money like this, is this the best thing for him to do? Someone who has all of the money that Scrooge has, and we understand that it is a considerable amount, is the best and most charitable thing to do to spend it? That's a very big question. Should, would, the better thing for Scrooge to do to be to invest in people rather than to give them money? What does that mean? What does it mean to invest in people? Well, would Bob Cratchit be worth more if he had other job skills? Further, when we see things, when we have this question of money raised and spending the money, giving to charity, is that the most good someone can do with their money? 
It depends. What does that charity look like? What does that charity do? How efficient is that charity with your money? This is why we can yell at the Jeff Bezoses and Elon Musks of the world if we want. A lot of times, it's not going to do very much good for them to give away money. We saw this when Elon Musk, a couple years ago, <clears throat> he, he threw out there the challenge. People said, you know, with... $400 million, whatever it is, instead of buying Twitter, you could solve world hunger. And he said, okay, put on paper how that would be, put on paper your plan, and if it is the case, I'll do it. Well, what ended up happening is that this, this charity that he had been going back and forth with decided not to re-engage with him, because a lot of these charities are grifts. A lot of these charities, you pump in $100,000 and you get $20,000 worth of actual goods, right? Actual difference-making material. So with this proposition thrown out there, oh, you could end world hunger by investing $400 million into my organization. Well, show me the plan, and the plan never comes. We understand what's going on there. Would that be the best thing for Scrooge to do for the social betterment? He has been a tax on society. That's the way that this is being set up. I am not 100% on board with that, uh, that someone is a tax on society by doing a good job and collecting their money and maybe not reinvesting all of it back into the community, whatever. Uh, we talked about this a little bit in Stave 1, about how more negatively we do judge people who maybe take their money and they're still not all that happy. They take their money and they just live a curmudgeonly life versus someone who takes that same amount of money, spends the same amount of money selfishly, and does not make a good in society. To me, those are kind of moral equivalents. Someone who does not want to engage with society writ large has that choice. We don't hold that against them when they are a pauper. We only hold it against them when they are rich. Now, you can see behind me, I'm not a rich guy, so I'm not defending that. I'm just saying, uh, you see the hovel in which I live. But this idea that um, throwing away, throwing around, throwing down money is the best thing to do is not sustainable. Money's not about availability. Money's about sustainability. If Scrooge were to invest, uh, mid-1800s, I believe the stock market was a real thing in, in London back then. Uh, the origin of stock markets, by the way, is very interesting. It has to do with shipping and um, things like that, if you ever decide to look into it. But say Scrooge were to invest in a dividend paying something or other, <clears throat> And that dividend paying something or other paid X amount of dividends per quarter that ended up paying someone's rent. You know, still you're, you're talking about giving a man a fish versus feeding a man versus teaching a man to fish, feeding a man versus uh, having that man learn sustainability. But it does work on a different scale. So is throwing around money by the wealthy the best thing to do? Or do those wealthy people continuing to run their business and employ people, Bob Cratchit gets to feed his family, maybe it's not the best living in the world, but he gets to feed his family every day by working for Scrooge. If Scrooge goes out and spends all this money and ends up going bankrupt, all of a sudden, maybe other people around town each have a few more shillings apiece, Bob Cratchit's out of a job. So I think there are levels on which we have to, now, obviously this is a fictional story, right? That is not the purpose of A Christmas Carol to ask those questions, but it's something that's set up for us to be able to do. We get this on page 65 and 66. He had not gone far when coming on towards him, he beheld the, this is uh, after Scrooge has come down onto the streets of London and been running around for a little bit as a changed man. He had not gone far. When coming on towards 
when coming on towards him, he beheld the portly gentleman who had walked into his counting house the day before and said, Scrooge and Marley's, I believe. It sent a pang across his heart to think how this old gentleman would look upon him when they met. But he knew what path lay, lay straight before him, and he took it. My dear sir, said Scrooge, quickening his pace and taking the old gentleman by both hands. How do I do? How do you do? I hope you succeeded yesterday. It was very kind of you. A Merry Christmas to you, sir. Mr. Scrooge? Yes, said Scrooge. That is my name, and I fear it may not be pleasant to you. Allow me to ask your pardon. And will you have the goodness? Here Scrooge whispered in his ear. Lord, bless me, cried the gentleman, as if his breath were gone. My dear Scrooge, are you serious? If you please, said Scrooge, not a farthing less. And a great many back payments are included in it, I assure you. Will you do me that favor? My dear sir, said the other, shaking hands with him, I don't know what to say, but uh, um, say to such muni... Don't say anything, please, retorted Scrooge. Come and see me. Will you come and see me? I will, cried the old gentleman, and it was clear he meant to do it. Thank you, said Scrooge. I am much obliged to you. I thank you fifty times. Bless you. Are we allowed to make up for our sins? Now, it's a difficult question, maybe more so now, than in the day when this was made. Remember, people used to have nothing to remember you by but their memory. Today, the Internet lives forever, and the Internet does not get defeated. The Internet is undefeated. This comes to us today in the form of cancel culture, right? Where you have said something at some point, and it will live forever if it's on the internet. And all we have to do is bring it up, and we have to take it as literally as can be in the worst light possible and understand that whatever that was that you had said is 100% you, 100% of the time. That's the world we live in today. That's a big part of why social cohesion seems to be falling apart. In this day, the day of Scrooge, it may have been that you had a reputation. Many people's reputation would have been for good, right? Everyone knows you. Everyone knows this thing. Everyone knows you're a jerk. Everyone knows you're a rich jerk. Everyone knows you're a rich jerk who is curmudgeonly and sticks to himself. Can that be turned around? Are you allowed to change your own character? Are you allowed to be something different? Largely, in the past, all you had to do was move town. Now, all you had to do, right? It sounds very condescending. All you had to do... But you could do it. People did it all the time. You, you, you want stories of this? Read about the Wild West in the United States. You could be a murderer, move to a new town, say you were the sheriff where you came from. No one knew any different. And then just be a murderer there. Right? Now, I'm not saying that we should um, murder people and get away with it. But this is a difference, isn't it? In some ways, we have gone from... Now, now back, in, back in the times of Scrooge, there were certain people who absolutely would have been labeled, right? You would be labeled as a thing. Expectations would be put on you as a thing, and you could not outlive them. And then we got to a very hippy-dippy place in society where everyone was sort of... Um, everything was excusable over a length of time. And now we're right back to the scarlet letter. It's just an interesting thing to observe. Um, can we get back to the place where people get forgiven? 
Can we get back to the place where being guilty of something doesn't make you guilty of everything? Can we get back to the place where people are understood as three-dimensional characters? Can we get back to the place where people get to evolve, get to um, mature at their rates? Right? The, one of the things that is sort of weird about today's culture, about internet culture. Everyone's supposed to know the exact same things at the exact same time and be the exact same place by maturity, by acceptance of responsibility, by all of these different things, right? And whose idea of maturity is it? Well, it's not yours. It'll never be yours, right? But here we have Scrooge deciding to be different one day. Deciding to wake up and be different one day. And it seems that he is accepted in all of these places. It seems that he is able to walk into his nephew's house and just have the dinner, go to the party, be a real person. Now, in the Darkest Element video that is going to be coming for A Christmas Carol... There are some weird things going on in this story that are worth looking at. There are some very strange things that might be working on a metaphorical level that, um, well, really is dark. So maybe look forward to that if that's the type of thing that you want to hear about. But <clears throat> the, the story ultimately is supposed to be one of, one of recompense. It is supposed to be a story of finding one's self or refinding oneself. It seems that Scrooge had lost himself mainly when he was brokenhearted, right? So are we allowed to change our own lives? As far as the craft is concerned, there's two things here that are really worth talking about. <clears throat> Pardon me. Here's the thing. It seems to me, and I haven't seen any of the movies in a very, very long time, it seems to me that in the movies, the final part of this, this movie, as it is in, in the movies, is much longer. The final stave here is five pages on a 68-page novel by the, um, what is this, uh, the... Dover reprinting. So five pages of a 68-page novel are sort of the victory lap of things. <clears throat> That's where we get to savor our hero's change of heart. It seems to me that that is a much larger portion of the movies that we get to spend more time with our hero as he goes around the changed man. Do we need it in literature? Now, what do I mean do we need it in literature if Hollywood gave it to us, if indeed Hollywood did give it to us? Why shouldn't we have it here? Well, it's called a Hollywood moment for a reason, right? It's called the Hollywoodification of literature. It's always um, much different than the book. The book is always better, right? <clears throat> do we need the time spent with Ebenezer Scrooge to understand that he is a changed character. Does it do us any good to get those sort of saccharine moments? If the dinner with, if the party with Scrooge's nephew was longer, if that scene were five pages itself versus just kind of being a couple paragraphs here, would that be better for us as the reader? Would we get more out of it as the reader? It may feel good, but how much more effective could it be? When we went there during the third stave with the second ghost, the second spirit, it lasted a little bit longer. Scrooge sat there answering questions during the whole game uh during the whole playing of games. He was an active participant in that. We didn't really get that this time around. Would it have, would it have benefited us 
to get it this time around? Or would it have been uh, just getting the same thing over again? But the, f the first time, Scrooge didn't get to enjoy it because he wasn't really there. So we didn't get to enjoy it because it wasn't an actual transformation of his character. This second time around, would it feel redundant or would we get more out of it? I think that's a question worth asking. I don't know that I necessarily know the answer. The one thing I do know about this stave is this this is one of my favorite character moments in maybe in literature now that I've read it. It was always one of my favorite things about movie incarnations of this story. Once Scrooge is seated at his desk the next day, and Bob had said, Oh, if I'm if I'm given the day off, sir, I'll be here twice as early the next day. Oh, you can believe that, sir. Well, Scrooge goes ahead and gives him the day off. And the next day, Bob is late. <clears throat> we get this. But he was early at the office the next morning talking about Scrooge. Oh, he was early there. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late. That was the thing he had his heart set upon. And he did it. Yes, he did it. The clock struck nine. No, Bob. A quarter past? No, Bob. He was a full eighteen and a half minutes late behind time. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come in to the tank. His hat was off before he opened the door, his comforter too. He was on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pins as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. Hello growled Scrooge, in his accustomed voice as near he could feign it. What do you mean by coming here at this time of day? I'm very sorry, sir, said Bob. I am behind my time. You are, said Scrooge. Yes, I think you are. Step this way, if you please. It's only once a year, sir, pleaded Bob, appearing from the tank. It shall not be repeated. I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. Now I'll tell you what, my friend, said Scrooge. I'm not going to stand this sort of thing any longer. And therefore, he continued, leaping from behind his stool and giving Bob such a dig at the waistcoat that he staggered back into the tank again, and therefore, I am about to raise your salary. Bob trembled and got a little nearer to the ruler. He had a momentary idea of knocking Scrooge down with it, holding him, and calling to the people in the court for help, and a straight waistcoat. That is a great character moment. Bob Cratchit does not know that Scrooge is a new man. Bob Cratchit knows that Scrooge was, well, a Scrooge. And he shows up late when he promised Scrooge that he would not. And Scrooge plays into it. A Scrooge-type character does not play into it. A literal jerk doesn't play into someone knowing they're a jerk. But he does. That is a great character. I, look, I don't have a pointer on that. I've not read that in any of my writing manuals. I don't know how. I don't know if there is a correct term and terminology for it. I don't know. I just know that's a great character moment. And to be able to put something like that into your writing is really sort of the holy grail of, um, of character transformations. The Adrian's Corner for this section is going to be brief, but by God, I just had to make it because it is something to be held. Now, there are a few different little f bits and phrases in this uh, sort of novella that take you off guard a little bit. And you, you, sometimes you, you just throw it away because this is not the 1850s. We're a long ways past where this was. Sometimes turns of phrase will be different. But one gave me pause here, and it was because 
well, I'll just get into it. That very last paragraph of this piece, we get this about Scrooge. He had no further intercourse with spirits, but lived upon the total abstinence principle ever afterwards. Now, total abstinence principle, I sort of knew what it was. I knew that it had to do sort of with like AA type deals, right? Uh, total abstinence principle, we do not touch alcohol at all. So I googled it just to see, you know, total abstinence principle. What does that mean? Am I missing something here? No, you will find it linked to teetotalism. What is teetotalism? Well, we have here from Wikipedia. Teetotalism is the practice or promotion of total personal abstinence from the consumption of alcohol, specifically in alcoholic drinks. A person who practices and possibly adv advocates teetotalism is called a teetotaler or teetotaler or a teetotaler or teetotaler or is simply said to be teetotal. Globally, almost half of adults do not drink alcohol, excluding those who used to drink, but have stopped. A number of temperance organizations have been founded in order to promote teetotalism and provide spaces for non-drinkers to socialize. And I thought, yeah, no, that's, that's exactly what I thought it was. But throughout this entire story, Scrooge doesn't touch alcohol. In fact, when you get around people who are merry and are enjoying themselves, it seems that they're indulging in alcohol. So, what's the deal? Why do we have something of a seeming hypocriticism by this novel? All of these people who were the good types were drinking in the moment, and Scrooge never touched it, but the moment he turns good, he swears he'll never touch it, but he never did. Is this something that, like, um, in order to have public access, uh, access to public access, you have to do public good? You have to promote some type of good, like we do with television and radio and things like that? Is this that type of thing? No. Let me read it again. He had no further intercourse with spirits, those ghosts but lived upon the total abstinence principle ever afterwards. But Charles Dickens, who uses the word ghost many times in this novel, didn't use ghost here. He called them spirits. Spirits, like you might refer to alcohol. Alcoholic spirits. Therefore, what he's saying is that... Scrooge did not have any further intercourse with the spirits and lived by total abstinence principle ever afterward. That's a bar. Bars. Dickens. Bars. He made a pun with spirits and total abstinence. So is that the biggest deal in this novel? No. No. But it was so well done and went completely over my head, and I had to point it out in case it went over anyone else's as well. He had no further intercourse with spirits, but lived upon the total abstinence of principle ever afterwards. And it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that truly be said of us and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone.